So guys, I figured a fun and entertaining way to go about testing some budget CPU coolers was to take this Ryzen 9 5950X 16 core 32 thread 105 watt TDP chip and put some budget cooling options on it and see what happens. But before you guys roast me in the comments, just one disclaimer. No, this isn't something I just went out and bought a 5950X to test some budget cooling options. I actually have it as an upgrade for my rig that I'm going to be doing here in the near future. So more on that in a video to come. But since I had the CPU on hand, knowing that it does produce the most amount of heat out of any of the Ryzen chip lineups, I wanted to take that as an example of well, if it can cool this chip, it basically can cool anything else, right? So what more can be said here, honestly, the, the idea here is to see if these budget cooling options can keep the highest heat producing chip cool. So that way, you know for sure if you've got something like a 3600X, a 5600X, 5800X, whatever it may be, if you know the top tier can stay cool, everything else underneath should be just fine. So before we jump straight into cooling performance and testing out all the coolers that I have here, I want to first talk about what we have and what we're using as our test hardware, being the motherboard, power supply, and of course 5950X, as well as the thermal paste that we're going to be using for all the coolers. So let's talk about that real fast. Alrighty guys, so onto the hardware that we're going to be using for testing here. And what we have here is a Gigabyte Aorus X570 Master. This is actually another personal part of mine that I'm going to be throwing in my personal rig update to come at a later date as mentioned. But this board has plenty of power delivery which support the 5950X just fine. That's kind of really what we're after. And because I had the parts on hand, you might as well use it. Additionally, I have a SSD here from Crucial that I've actually had for several years but it's got an OS installed on it and it's got an ADA64 license on it which we'll be using for benchmarking. So and for display we're not after gaming performance so no need to slap on a big beefy video card or anything like that. I just got a basic OEM video card that I pulled out of a system years ago. I really just use this for display when I'm doing things like CPU, motherboard testing, things like that. For power, I got a power supply that was actually sent over to me by a company called Segotip. So by the way, thank you guys for sending that on over. And this is a 600 watt, 80 plus gold rated power supply. So should deliver a good clean power to the board. That way we have optimal power delivery to the CPU and obviously produce the most amount of heat. And I don't think there's really a need to mention it again, but I will go ahead and do so. We are doing all the CPU cooler testing with a Ryzen 9 5950X. Again, the reason I chose it because it is the highest power draw CPU that Ryzen currently produces. So if we got a good budget cooling option that works with that one, then it's gonna work basically with the full lineup. So lastly, one of the most critical things to talk about in regards to CPU cooler performance is thermal paste. So what I got here is some Chinese branded thermal paste that says high performance thermal grease, the GD900 brand. So I'll, I'll kind of put it up here on camera, but where I got the idea to pick up this stuff was actually from a video from Brian from Tech Yes City, uh, probably years ago at this point. I've had this tube for quite a while. I am starting to kind of get low, but this stuff is really good stuff and it's like nine bucks on eBay. I'll leave a link to it in the description below, but it's actually something that Brian recommended on his channel. And I figured, you know what? If he's using it, it should be pretty good. And so far it's done pretty well for me. But the main thing here being is we use a constant, the same thermal paste on all the coolers. I wanna test what the cooling performance of the manufacturing process of the actual cooler provides. And I don't want there to be any variance by switching up thermal paste. So we're gonna use the same thermal paste on every single cooler. And we're also gonna use the same application method being just a P size dot in the middle and let the cooler kind of smash it down and spread it out evenly. That way everything remains as constant as possible. So last thing to mention too, which is also another critical important thing about doing temperature testing on CPUs and, and systems is we're going to make sure that we stay at a constant 73 right now, which it is. And I got just kind of a basic little, you know, thermometer here that I usually keep on my desk, but we're going to try to keep it in the same constant at, at about a 73 to 75 degree temperature variance. That way we don't have any room temperature influencing the thermal tests on our system. So what further to do than to just jump right in with our testing. And the first cooler we're going to start off with is the good old stock AMD Wraith Stealth Cooler. It's gonna be toasty. Let's get into it. Alrighty, on with the stock Wraith Cooler, which we now have installed on the board. Quick mention here too, I'm doing all these tests as an open air test to not have any other influencing factors on the cooling capacity of the CPU cooler. Also, the motherboard is running complete out of the box BIOS settings, nothing configured in there that would influence our results. 
So first thing we're gonna do here is run Cinebench five times over back to back and average the score so we could see the performance of each cooler and how that changes as we change the coolers. So with five runs of Cinebench, the Wraith cooler netted us an average of 24,769. But now on with the stress test using ADA64. With ADA64, I'm also keeping a constant test of running it for 20 minutes to ensure the CPU and cooler get a full heat saturation and then we will look at the numbers in full. So first here, I want you guys to see how quickly the CPU comes up to temperature with the Wraith cooler. As like we saw in my previous video where I thermally tested a 3600 with the Wraith cooler, which I'll have as a link in the top right hand corner, it skyrockets in temperature in mere seconds. Though after a 20 minute run, surprisingly, I did not have any kind of thermal shutdowns. The CPU just throttled to a point to maintain usability, albeit not very great clock speeds, but still running. We can see here our average load temp came in at 91 degrees Celsius, but in order to maintain not overheating, we can easily also see that the CPU pulled way back in power usage down to measly 1.061 average voltage. And our clock speeds obviously also reflect that only at a measly 3.67 average. And the highest boosted clock speed recorded just just came in at 4.5 gigahertz before serious throttling took over. This is kind of neat to see the CPU maintain function on such a low grade cooler, but obviously this is not advisable to run the cooler on a 5950X or for most Ryzen CPUs in general. Clearly, a lot of performance is still left on the table due to thermal constraints. All right, so keeping things stock here for one more test, we're gonna check out the stock Prism cooler. This cooler definitely shows to have a lot more potential to cool way better than the Wraith cooler. It has four direct touch copper heat pipes that draw heat away from the CPU and into a pretty sizable fin stack with a down firing fan. I actually really like the look of this cooler, but let's see how it performs. So on to Cinebench, our five run score average came up quite significantly over the Wraith cooler. The total average score of all runs came in at 25,884. That's over a 1,000 point difference between the two coolers. Additionally, we saw great gains with the Ada 64 stress test, coming in with an average load temperature now down to 79.8 degrees Celsius, a 4.229 average clock speed, 4. 0.575 max boost clock speed across most of the cores and average voltage draw came up to 1.192 volts. So clearly a huge performance difference not only in temperatures but also CPU performance because now we have much better cooling capacity to allow the CPU to stretch its legs, boost up to higher clock speeds while staying cool. Alrighty now let's take a look at some aftermarket solutions. First one we have on the list and one of my favorites of all time is the Cooler Master Hyper 212. This cooler I love so much due to its price and performance. And this cooler has all the makings of a great CPU cooler with four direct touch heat pipes feeding a large towering fin stack as well as a high RPM 120 millimeter fan. There isn't a lot of CPUs out there that this cooler cannot keep under control. Additionally, this cooler has seen a lot of neat design revisions over time if you're looking for a good aesthetic too, all still remaining a good budget option. So we clearly saw evidence of its performance in the numbers. Cinebench comes up yet again with this cooler to an average of 26 6,089 or about 200 points over the best stock cooling option from AMD. Additionally, we saw even cooler temperatures on the ADA64 run averaging a low temperature of 76.2 degrees Celsius, an average of 4.3 gigahertz clock speed with the highest observed boost clock of 4.625 and a 1.212 average voltage draw. Clearly, based on all those numbers, the Hyper 212 unlocked another tier performance for the 5950X. Next up on the list, we have the Vitru V5. This cooler was also a part sent over to me by Vitru to take a look at, and what better way to put it through its paces than to see what it can do in these tests. Coming in at just $35, which can be found on Amazon, this cooler packs a serious punch. It has a lot of the makings of the Hyper 212, but actually with an additional heat pipe. The fin stack is a bit smaller than the Hyper 212, but overall, this cooler performs just as well. Additionally, I can't say enough how much I like the simplicity of this cooler based on its mounting solution, as well as the Aesthetic, it just is a fantastic looking cooler coming in with a stealthy black finish or a sleek snowy white. So on with the Cinebench run, the Vitru averaged just a hair bit lower than the Hyper 212 coming in at 25,838 average. The cooling performance though was near within margin of error compared to the Hyper 212 with an average low temperature of 78.3 degrees Celsius, the clock speeds averaging 4.269 gigahertz, highest observed clock speed on cores 5 and 8 at 4.6 gigahertz, and average voltage draw of 1.2 
202. Again, a formidable cooler for a very tough cooling scenario. I would highly recommend this cooler. Next up, we have yet another cooler that was provided to me by a vendor called PC Cooler. When PC Cooler reached out to me to review some of their products and I had caught eye on their massive six heat pipe dual fan cooler, I had to give it a shot. This cooler is called the PC Cooler GI-G66A which comes in a bit higher price than the previous coolers at $55.99, however packs a punch in terms of cooling performance and really blew me away in the looks department. Anywho, on with the performance numbers. With Cinebench, the cooler managed an average of 25,970, which puts it right smack in the middle between the Hyper 212 and the Vitro V5. As far as cooling performance, it managed 76.7 degrees Celsius average, a 4.266 average gigahertz clock speed with the highest observed clock speed of 4.601 across many of the cores and a 1.192 average voltage draw. This cooler is really neat but does have some drawbacks. The mounting system is far more complex than the other coolers. It is much heavier and you may have potential RAM clearance issues as well as the RGB cabling became kind of a huge mess. However, it is well done in terms of quality of the product. I wonder too if how well it would perform with just one fan attached or maybe just removing the fancy looking shroud to allow the fin stack to breathe a bit better. Overall though, this cooler still performs quite well over stock and remains on my recommended list. So thank you PC Cooler for sending this on over. All right, and for the last air cooler on the list and coming in at just a squeak over $60 on Amazon, we have the Deepcool Neptwin RGB V3. This is a monster cooler. I elected though to go with this cooler because I wanted to find a budget option around the $60 mark, but also a cooler that uses the twin fin stack tower design. This cooler also has six heat pipes run through the twin fin stack towers, as well as utilizes dual 120 millimeter fans. This kind of cooler design is more or less the type you would find that can compete or even sometimes beat the cheaper AIO options out there. So, how did it stack up? For Cinebench, this cooler beat quite handily all the other air cooler options tested, coming in with an average score of 26,236, or nearly 150 more points than the Hyper 212, which was our previous champ. As for thermal testing, again, the cooler did the best with the average low temperatures of 74.3 degrees Celsius, netting in a 4.339 gigahertz average core clock, and all cores boosting up to a max of 4.6 gigahertz, with one of those cores hitting 4.62. Two, six. Lastly, averaging 1.221 volts average power draw. Hands down, this was the best performing air cooler, but can a cheap AIO even compete? Let's find out. So last but certainly not least, I had to throw in an AIO. And the greatest thing about this AIO is the price to performance. This is the Cooler Master ML 240L RGB. This cooler I picked up on Amazon for $60 at the time. With now a budget water cooling option in hand, let's see how well it performs. This cooler as expected, beats out all the air cooler options, but honestly, not by huge margins. Well then, on with the Cinebench runs, and of the five runs, we average a score of 26,323, putting this cooler at number one, but only with an 87 point difference over the Nep Twin. Still, a measurable win. So with the higher average Cinebench scores, that can only mean one thing, right? Better cooling. So as you would expect, the AIO does not really have a huge difference in terms of temperature performance. However, it is notable coming in at 71.2 degrees average temperature, a 4.33 gigahertz average core clock speed through the whole test with a 4.601 max across most of those cores and a 1.216 volt average power draw. Obviously here with the AIO while operating with lower temperatures leads to higher clock speeds and performance, but also notably was a much more quiet solution. So now that definitely makes me wonder how my Corsair 360 millimeter AIO will do when I install this CPU into my personal rig. Alrighty guys, so budget cooler roundup is now complete. We definitely have a lot of different price points as well as styles of coolers, but I'd have to say I have one particular favorite and that being the Vitro V5. Honestly, it just, you really can't beat the price to performance of this cooler. Sure, it doesn't cool quite as well as something like an AIO, but it has all of the great features of a good cooler and it stays nice and quiet and it has, like I said, a great price. But that will about do it for this one. I got another video on screen. Check that one out. I think you might enjoy it. Get subscribed on your way out and I'll catch you guys in the next one.